Welcome to Warwick Business School's Core Insights podcast on fintech. This is the third in a series of podcasts on fintech with the school's Gilmore Centre for Financial Technology. In this series, with the help of the centre's world-class researchers and professors, and alongside guests from the fintech industry, we're exploring the big issues as the financial sector continues to grapple with new technology. My name is Natasha de Turan, a former financial journalist and author of The Payoff, How Changing the Way We Pay Changes Everything. Today, the question we're going to tackle is what does DeFi need to go mainstream? And that's a very big question. So I'm very lucky to be joined by two experts. Briefly to introduce them, Kalina is an assistant professor of information systems and management at Warwick Business School. She holds an elite master's degree in international law, economics and management, and a PhD in information systems. Kalina joined Warwick Business School in 2021, where her research focuses primarily on innovation and competition strategies within digital platforms. Within fintech, she investigates topics related to digital payment platforms open banking and blockchain. So quite a lot there. (laughs) Erica Stanford is one of the only people I've ever known, or the first person I've ever known, to be on at the limit of her connections on LinkedIn. Um, One of the reasons for that possibly is that she's the founder and CEO of Crypto Curry Club, the UK's number one rated networking and educational events venue for crypto, blockchain and fintech. Another reason for it is that she's the author of the award-winning book, Crypto Wars, Fake Deaths, Missing Billions and Industry Disruption. And in her spare time, of which she presumably has lots, she's a guest lecturer at Warwick Business School on the use cases and applications of crypto and digital currency. So before we try to answer the question whether um, what DeFi needs to go mainstream, um, it'd be worth asking whether mainstream needs DeFi to to get there. But um, let's just explore what DeFi is and what it isn't and what distinguishes it from CFI or centralised finance, which is what we've always known and loved. So happy to start and, and thank you. Nice to meet you, Natasha, and, and thank you for the introduction. I should add, I also work at CMS Law Firm uh, as a fintech specialist. So that that's what takes up most of the time. <laughs> so less, less free time, I'm, I, I'm sad to say. So what DeFi is, I, I think the easiest way to explain it and to keep things really simple, it's decentralized finance. So how I describe centralized finance is, as you say, it's been the traditional Um, method where you've got one company or one person or one controlling element right at the top that basically makes the most decisions which works in some ways it's easier to do things like get regulated and to appoint lawyers Mm -hmm. and and do things in 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 a way that adheres to society it's it's easier to do things like get insurance and and set up structures to keep things safe it also means that you're putting all of the power and control into the hands of one company or one leadership team or, or often one person so defi decentralized finance is is basically going away from that Uh, so it's a structure where you've got not one person that can make all of the decisions but rather a distributed set of of, of, well it's called sometimes nodes in in DeFi but you've got a distributed set of of people or 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 sometimes it's technology sort of people (laughs) so forth um but that that's getting complicated so that that are able to make decisions and have voting rights which might be attributed to how much they've invested it might be attributed to how much time they've invested it might be attributed to how much good they've done for that organization or it might be that one person has a a vote in decisions so why that's good i i'd say is there's a lot of problems with the centralized structures i think we're all familiar with some of the many many problems that have come with some of the uh, centralized social media platforms, for example, we don't need to mention names, where there's a heavy control of, of data ownership and, and users hand over data and, and basically have no rights or say whatsoever over that. And that's been a problem in finance as well. So one of the, the problems, the core problem in centralized finance is users hand over their money or put over their crypto or their, their money into a centralized pool and what's happened many times is that that pool disappears so sometimes it's because the founder is is a fraudster and and effectively goes thank you very much for for your money or for your crypto i'm going to disappear with it that's happened many times or they make mistakes 
or if it isn't so much the founder or the, the founding team that's criminal, which has happened many times, you're putting your money in a sort of centralized pool. And then if that gets hacked or broken into, that all disappears together. So what the DeFi, the decentralized finance system means is not only is it decentralized in decision making for the governance, but it also means that every individual user in theory has control over their own money or their own mm. crypto or their own digital assets. So they're not entrusting the safekeeping of that to a centralized uh, in, well, or corporation or individual, but rather they're looking after their own money or their own assets, they're custodying their own assets, which brings separate problems that if they lose their <laughs> private keys or password to okay. those, Right. Then, but it's it's a way of storing money without trusting other people. That was a very very long winded way of answering. <laughs> that. I'm sorry. <laughs> storing money and, and I guess doing other things. I liked um you. I think you slipped in in theory there, which I think we'll we'll come back to the in theory safer. Helena, do you want to um, yeah. explain crypto yeah. and so CFI DeFi? probably from another perspective. And I like uh, how Erica started with this distinction between centralization and decentralization, which has been a very big focus on how people talk about it in industry, also researchers. But recently in research, we started um, seeing, including my own, that, well, that's actually not exactly the case, right? This centralization versus decentralization is not such a clear cut distinction. And you have seen significant centralization movements and efforts within um, DeFi as well for various reasons, right? And this is what I study quite a lot around the governance of these smart contracts um, using DAOs and under other protocols. So in that sense, what we start seeing in research is that, well, maybe the difference is not only centralization versus decentralization, but maybe the difference... Uh, what DeFi tries to do vis-a-vis -vis traditional centralized finances. And I think, Eric, you touched upon is, is there are lots of issues with the current systems we have right now, which, for example, goes to, you know, very big transaction fees, hidden fees, um, financial exclusion, not many people, want, um, you know, who actually want to have bank account or you know, borrow money from the, uh, established institutions that can actually do so, right? Or for example, settlement time takes ages if you want to do cross-border payments, right? So there are lots of inherent problems in the current financial systems, uh, mainly down to how we designed them many, many years ago, right? Um, and the IT systems were built there, right? And now for me, DeFi is more about centralization. Decentralization is very important, definitely. But it's really about using a new technology, uh, distributed technology, and uh, new capabilities that can actually maybe help us solve some of these um, underlying challenges. For example, uh, coming down the transaction, um, reducing the transaction fees, um, increasing settlement times, and stuff like this. So I think the promise actually really came here. And it is true, as Erica said, that there was a lot of also push towards this idea of let's um, you know come up with our own systems where we don't rely on centralized authorities that was a very big push and central push i agree with that but i think as the community has matured and changed over the years um we're actually seeing a bit different mix between centralization and decentralization uh because decentralization comes with their own its own issues it's not it's not the um, you know the, the holy grail it's not gonna give us everything but it comes with its own issues um that needs to be tackled with you mentioned smart contracts and so forth, which I think is probably one of the, the biggest benefits or uh, excitements around the, the whole DeFi world. But um, let, let's go back to the high street. I think you both come from the standing point that it would be good for the high street to get DeFi. Um, we still use the banks that are on the high street precisely because we <laughs> trust the central authorities rather than uh, putting our money with the neobanks. But um, <laughs> putting that aside, what will what will take DeFi to the high street and what what will what will it take for the high street to accept DeFi? And I suppose those are two separate things. So how will DeFi be enabled to get to the retail customer? And I'm talking in a permitted environment, shall yeah. we say, as opposed to an environment that's that's taking place and isn't quite um is might not be prohibited, but it isn't explicitly encouraged. Yeah, uh well there are lots of issues actually that first needs to be solved before we actually see a mainstream. And for me, one of the first thing first is the technical capabilities, right? 
uh, outlined lots of these um, amazing benefits that people were thinking that we can get from blockchain. And I'm sure they are there, but we are still very in early stages of development of the whole technology. And we've seen a lot of movements towards this. There are lots of experimentation, whether it's going to be with uh, the first blockchain, which is the Bitcoin blockchain, whether it's going to be with the other ones appearing like Ethereum, where the smart contracts comes, where it's going to be Solana or many different things. We have seen lots of uh, efforts to push this technology and realize this promise. And I think still we are not really there, right? So I don't think that technology has matured enough in order what it can do, for example, let's say in the area of lending where people have thought that this is really going to be quite interesting. Um, I don't think it's still there, right? And I, that's not because people don't have the vision, uh, but because the technology is still there, uh, still not there, right? It solves some kind of issues, but introduces another issues just by the nature of it and until we solve all of this in a very seamless way we're not gonna get it uh, mainstream not to mention other issues around um, education around usability around security which probably we can also maybe delve in a bit more erica from your standpoint um no i i think there's a lot of reasons and, mm -hmm. and a lot of things that are, are separating it still from being mainstream firstly the user experience DeFi is, by any definition of the word, not easy to use. Um, it, it ranges from difficult to incredibly difficult, depending on which platform you're using. And there's a lot of steps to, to take. Secondly, there's a lot of safety and, and security issues for every good DeFi platform, whether the team are, are intending to do a, a really good job and, and provide exactly what they say they're trying to provide. There's at least one that isn't trying to do that. And, and that is more intent on, on parting people from their money. And, and going back to uh, I think what Kalina mentioned earlier, the, the difference between DeFi and, and, and CeFi is sometimes in what the founders would like it to be known as. <laughs> and, 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 and some platforms that call themselves decentralized are, are anything but. So I, I think that there's a few things. Firstly, it needs to be easier to, to use for most people. Secondly, the security issues need to be addressed, which is A, people to be able to differentiate between knowing this is a good platform and that is a bad platform or a, a scam. At the moment, there's no centralized body, which going back to the sort of the, the mm -hmm. uh, antithesis of the argument, but that there isn't a body or a, a one auditing agency that can test every platform and, and say, yes, this is a good platform and oh, that's a bad platform. There's even been one audited platform that was found to have accepted payment to describe a DeFi platform as, as good. And, and that was a, a scam in itself. So th there's a huge number of problems. And I know I'm the cynical one. I wrote a book about scams and, and hear more about scams than most people. But the, the reality is that there's still a lot of problems in that space and, and of course you've got that in every industry but uh, i'd say it's, it's a factor that needs to be addressed and then a, a practicality of, of DeFi, it's harder for DeFi platforms not not impossible but harder to do things practical things like get banked that's a real major problem i, I work at the made law firm dealing that, that work helps most of these companies and and one of the the main problems they have is being able to do things like set up a, a company structure that that's legal mm. in, in various jurisdictions get a bank account that accepts them for what they're doing work out what aml and kyc requirements are because it's it's such a new industry that these things are just being shaped so at the moment that there's no clear regulation so they have to basically work with lawyers to effectively translate or guess what is the legal structure for for them to act in a in a legal way so that there's huge barriers to to DeFi platforms to just set up safely and 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 legally which i i do think will come in in time i think what will bring DeFi mainstream is there's a lot of huge global retail and other platforms that are, are, are even looking at what they can do with DeFi or, or are looking to integrate that. And maybe that's 
ha having wallets to do things like give out incentive points or loyalty mm. points or loyalty rewards or, or build a community or offer digital assets. So I, I think what it will really take is all of those operational issues to be addressed. But we are seeing traditional finance and traditional banks and so forth going slightly more positive towards it. But then I, I think what it will really take is one of the global giants to launch a big DeFi thing which will just mm -hmm. become mainstream on everyone's on everyone's phones and do you think when it gets to us on the high street people like me do you think we'll even know that we're using defi no, no. It, exactly and I, I think that that's a crucial thing uh, for example i have no idea how or how anything works really but i have no idea how email works or you know how a, a whatsapp message works i think what it will end up being for it to go really mainstream is is for example now um, we have WhatsApp or other messaging platforms where you can send a message, you can send a photo, you can send a video, you can send a file, you can send a voice note, you can send all sorts of things. I, I think the next step will be we send digital assets or we send digital currency um, via a, a common messaging platform. WhatsApp actually tried, but they got shot down by the regulators, but mostly because of the affiliation with Facebook and regulators don't trust Facebook because of various previous incidences around around user data and, and trust. So it might yeah. not be WhatsApp, it, it might be another one. And I, I think the other practical feature that that's a barrier is, is at the moment DeFi. So decentralized finance tokens and assets and cryptocurrencies are, are hugely volatile mm. and, and, and massively manipulated and then you've got the stable coins which nobody really trusts because they say they're backed by assets and then it's found out that they're not mm. as backed as they would like to promote that they are so th there's still a, a need for maybe that's less volatile cryptocurrencies or more backed stable assets or so forth for it to be a really practical method of, of sending money. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with what um, Erica was saying. And I'm also more on the skeptic side than the, um, um, the optimistic side, predominantly because I do not fundamentally see as of yet a really good killer application or killer use of DeFi that could be there right we talked about even payments you can't really do it yes you can do some transactions but that may be within the the closed um ecosystem cryptocurrency ecosystem yes you can do some trading but then volatility and stuff uh the promising cases around remittances around lending maybe even financial inclusion we're not there yet we don't see it there yet. um it's very difficult to be to be done um usability security issues so I still think we need kind of to have a good um, use case developed for this, right? Uh, to be to be there and really um, beat um, the current propositions of the of the CFI. Um, the other thing that I found quite uh, problematic is, and I want to emphasize it a bit more, is around the education, right? And the complexity of, of the DeFi. It's actually becoming much, much more complex because the more you develop, experiment, the more people um, make it um, interesting, the more concepts they add, right? And that becomes it not simple enough. Most of the people who actually are the front, front runners of this DeFi movement are developers and they're amazing smart visionaries but they're not very good in communicating and explaining what it is and i think for this to go mainstream yes of course what erica was saying i need to that should be the rails behind some kind of a, a very simple consumer front end um the question is with the established ones i mean why do you need blockchain to do that right i mean if you think about the payment rails with the remittances I have seen other fintech startups that are not blockchain based that actually try to do that, right? They try to push the, um, the payment rails behind um, the established banks and how we send money abroad, um, try to disrupt that without relying on blockchain, right? So we are starting to see much more um, innovation on the infrastructure end on the payments or financial services in general, something that wasn't possible couple of years ago but maybe even blockchain will not be the the payment rail that will actually substitute what we have currently in mainstream maybe it will be something else um so i think there's still lots of developments to be to be done here but yeah still lots of promises but nothing really um on the table yet to be I, mainstream 
Just on the I payment think, side, though, is it is it not really actually rather than disrupting the rails or um, it is uh, it, they're not so much disrupting, they're bypassing, but but they're not bypassing actually fundamentally. Not, they're yeah, exactly, just bypassing the system as because the, you, you do see yes. it on the high streets. Exactly, because you do need to connect to some kind of a bank account, right? And this is again the case of why financial inclusion is so difficult, right? It was over promised because all of a sudden. Uh, there are many people who don't have bank accounts and can't even, you know, participate in DeFi because they do not have bank accounts to uh, connect to this um, cryptocurrency exchanges or wallets or whatever uh, service they're looking into it. Uh, so, yeah, what I'm saying is that it still requires lots of um, thinking and development before we actually can can create the value that we need out of it. I think just to add to that, the why, why blockchain question that, that Kalina yeah. raised, um, I think that there's two parts to that. Blockchain has been sometimes promoted as the, the be all end all solution to every every problem. And, yeah. and you know, that, that that clearly demonstrably isn't the case. What what I would say is why blockchain and why DeFi is there's a lot of places in the world and, and the UK is fast becoming one of them where, where governments by pure definition cannot be trusted. And and that ranges from cannot be trusted to have totally destroyed the economy and, and yeah. led the country into hyperinflation or are utterly corrupt. I, I lived in Argentina for a while and, and attitudes to finance there very are yeah. very, very different. And, and that's that's not exclusive to Argentina. So I, I think why blockchain, one of the core aspects of, of blockchain is you've got a higher level of, of trust the way the technology works is, is you can see clearly this address yep. sent this transaction at this time to that address so if for example i send a transaction to to natasha at this time it that's publicly visible it can't be disputed and and the way that the blockchain works makes transactions it gives more transparency but it also makes it a lot safer mm. which if, if you're coming from a point of well my bank's always worked and i can pay everything by clicking you know one click on my amazon yeah account or tapping things with my iPhone, maybe you don't need DeFi if you're coming point, from a point of view where the, the economy is is destroyed. I can't keep money in my local currency because by tonight it will be eroded in hyperinflation. It's it's not possible or safe for me to send money out of these borders because whatever mm -hmm. reason, but due to a corrupt government or so forth, then blockchain becomes a very clear yes, this is a, a better and a safer way for people to store money. So in, in, in many places, the move has been more from having to trust local governments or banks, mm -hmm. which are just inherently not geared to helping citizens, to Bitcoin and, and cent well, not, not that Bitcoin is a centralized cryptocurrency, but, but to Bitcoin and, and other platforms. I imagine the next step would be more to, to DeFi just as an extra way of, of security and of bypassing the limitations placed on people through no fault of their own. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think from speaking to a lot of, of younger people here, e even in the UK, trust for the government is only going downhill and, and trust for centralised institutions mm -hmm. and trust in the banking system. And, and people have seen parents or, or friends lose all of their money. In, in, in banks or in pension funds and so forth. So I, I think there is more of a demand mm -hmm. for keeping one's money in a place where it can't just be taken away by a corrupt government or a corrupt government or eroded in inflation or, or so forth. So I, I, I think that answers the why blockchain question, at, at, at least yeah. to me from my point of view. And then the, uh, as you say, there's a lot of people. It's about two and a half billion people around the world, about a third of the world's population that don't have access to the traditional banking system. And, and that isn't going to change. It isn't financially worth their while for banks mm. to, to serve those people because yeah. they're not mm. enough. Yeah. And, and yet there's systems being set up where people are being given digital wallets and all, all they need is a smartphone, which costs $10 in many places. So most of these people do have access to a smartphone and internet and can then receive money in, in, in cryptocurrency or in, in, in digital money without 
uh, people that have never had any form of ID and realistically won't ever get a form of ID, but are able to sign up by biometric, biometric identity, for example, and, and create mm. an ID in the first place. There's a, a phenomenal project which it touches on, on DeFi called Plastic Bank and they, they pay people to collect pa- plastic and they give them a digital wallet. And, and for the first time in their lives, they're able to store money digitally and save money and get loans and get mini mortgages and, and pay money digitally instead of in cash. So, and and they're, they're people that would realistically never be served by the traditional banking system. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. for me, that's the main benefits and the main use cases of, of blockchain and DeFi. And I, I think it's a little bit sad that those get sometimes washed away because all of the focus is on price of whatever coin goes up or price of whatever yeah. coin goes down. So if I if I can, you're not such a skeptic then, Erica. <laughs> no, I, I think there's a lot of real use cases at, that that are very good and that are better than the existing financial system in 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 many ways. And I think one has to be aware of the risks and of the limitations mm-hmm. of where it is now. Um, well, let me move on to the to the to the R word that we haven't really touched on yet. In in your view, both of you, when this DeFi world is upon us and is architected in a in a more high street kind of focused way, and whether we're talking wholesale regulated wholesale institutions using DeFi in a meaningful way before it sort of displaces HSBC on uh, Kensington High Street, are you envisaging that uh, fiat currencies or CBDC are at the centre of this? Are you envisaging that the Bank of England, the FCA, and you know, CFTC and organisations like this, regulators are at present, or is all of this redundant in that future world mm-hmm. and we just need lawyers? I think they'll be present. And in the Cryptotopia, yes, the DeFi was actually created as an alternative in a way that it's either or. But I think for a very long time, they will be living together. And actually, I don't think, um, probably never, I mean, that's, of course, nobody knows, of course, what's going to happen. But at least for the foreseeable future, you will not see a world that's only DeFi driven, right? You're going to have a different mix of um, symbiosis in a way. And we have started seeing it with some established institutions, banks, uh, but also, you know, established fintech like PayPal trying to you know, embrace cryptocurrencies one way or another, offer stable coins or offer the ability to, to exchange it, um, cryptocurrencies around. So I think we're going to see that, like opening up to this. And I think it's really becoming like alternative ways of how people uh, want to do it. Ultimately, what's going to decide whether you're going to keep having these services or not will be the consumer adoption in the end of the day. It's the same with payments, right? You have multiple payment instruments, you have cash you have credit cards debit cards you have also mobile payments right and from different providers and Mm. ultimately what most banks are doing at least in scandinavia where i researched um, a lot is actually opening up to everything and say i enable it for you and you consumer decide what you fundamentally want to use and ultimately we're also going to see users following from the user behavior currently that what we have seen, utilizing different combination of payment instruments with different things, right? So you can have your, I don't know, loan from DeFi platform, but maybe your savings, I don't know, will be in a bank. Or if in a case, in a country where you don't trust your government, maybe your savings will be there, but maybe you're still going to have, um, I don't know, a mortgage loan or something different, some kind of a different financial service with a regular bank. Or maybe you can also see different polarizations where you see, yeah, only people using DeFi, but maybe um, and only people using centralized um, financial services or maybe in combination between. But I don't think it will be a complete substitution of one for the other. I don't think that we're going to see that. I don't think that's also na- the nature of finance services in, in general. But for that, just for that coexistence, um, to yeah. your point earlier, uh, Erica, we'd need a perfect sort of AML KYC environment in the DeFi world for, you know, yeah. Dendanska to be happy to, to see money coming in and out of the DeFi world. Yeah, and, and that's one of the, the sort of core and interesting questions because for many parties, regulators, for example, for, for DeFi to exist and probably for mainstream use, that they want to have a degree of AML and KYC. And for DeFi to exist in its core purest form by pure definition, AML and KYC can't happen. And that's one of the questions that I don't know if there's an answer to. Now, I know a few 
AML lawyers who would be the first to argue that, that AML just doesn't work and, and traditionally hasn't worked. I, that, I, I can see there's arguments for that. And I can also see that there's arguments that if there's no type of, of AML, then North Korean hackers will just be able yeah. to pay people to use their accounts and, and cash out exactly as they are doing now, but mm. with with even less barriers in, in, in between there. So as far as I know, I haven't met a single person that knows the answer <laughs> to that question. I, I would love to meet such a person if there is an answer mm. to that. Um, I, I think to, to your previous question, Natasha, I, I don't see banks going anywhere. I, I don't know if that would be the ideal scenario that they serve a purpose, as you say, to have money in, in a place. I mean, in, in the UK, we have government backed bank accounts up to a certain amount. That, that isn't the case everywhere, but that serves a, a real purpose. Um, mm. Loans, mortgages, things like that. It's very useful to have the traditional banking system. I can't imagine that being replaced in our lifetimes. So um, do you think it would be more for moving things around than for what, storage? What what I I, I I think is there was one of the leading banks that quite famously lost about 20% of its customers overnight when they said, well, if you do anything with crypto, yeah. we won't bank you. Yeah. And they then subsequently realized that we've got to backtrack on that because mm -hmm. a lot of young people and a lot of people want not necessarily to store their life savings in, in crypto or DeFi assets, but to have that option or, or to have a little bit. So what I, I imagine will be happening, we'll be seeing is like with PayPal, you'll be able to log on to your traditional banking app if that's how you want to do it. And you'll be able to see I've got whatever, 10 pounds in pounds sterling and 10 pounds in, in Bitcoin or 10 pounds in whatever. Um, for, for one example. So uh, what I imagine will happen is, is for those who want their assets to be sort, stored in a more centralized way, you'll be able to do that via your the traditional bank account, or at least be able to buy these assets with your traditional bank account. And then for those who want to escape the system altogether, they might still have a traditional bank account, but store most of their assets in a decentralized wallet, which is completely offline and unhackable and unaccessible by anyone else. So what what I imagine is there'll there'll be the the whole range and then people will be able to lean to whichever level of, of centralization or decentralization they're happiest with. Gosh, it's gonna be a real <laughs> a really yeah. diverse landscape. But one of one of the things that I I question when I sort of read or, or look at this world is when we look at the the costs and inefficiencies in the and and a lot of the problems, in fact, that arise in the current financial system, um, is that you you effectively have lots of silos and you have a lot of different interests. Some of them private, some of them shared, some of them public. And there's legacy technology and there's legacy systems and there's been mergers and there's acquisitions and there's been patching and so on and so forth. And it's all of that that drives a lot of the imperfections that we have in in the system today. We then, and, and if one thinks about those imperfections at a national level, then the current, you know, our, our sovereign currencies, our fiat currencies are also separate imperfections because of course, every time you move from one currency or nation's laws, you, you know, you have to go through, um, uh, you know, the exchanges and separate M um, AML and KYC. So these frictions, some of them are societal and, you know, Denmark's still gonna be that, the UK is still gonna be there probably. Um, so the, these, the nation state isn't going away. The fiat currencies are probably, I think you said, not going away. Um, and we have a lot of different providers or you know, innovators coming up uh, with different, different ideas, different blockchains, different smart contracts, different mm -hmm. silos of activity. Is, is the, how are we going to get to a future, a DeFi future, in which the, anything seamless can happen at all? Because private interests are private interests, <laughs> and and they do tend to sort of stick up walls around themselves, even if they've only just you know been created by accident through the te technology that they've used. In my experience uh, working with banks, lots of them are actually trying to do their own digital transformation of their legacy systems. A very painful, long uh, project, but they're on it. Going to take 
good years to be completed. There are some um, private blockchain projects within banks to create actually this infrastructure um, systems efficiently, sometimes blockchain-based, sometimes not. So there's lots of innovation that we're going to see more in that. The first wave of fintech innovation was really consumer services and front-end innovation. Now, the, the way we mature more, we're actually going to see more infrastructure innovation, and we have started seeing it on the back end of the, of the um, traditional finance. And that's where blockchain can contribute, or maybe not. Maybe we come up with an alternative system mm -hmm. that makes things better. We don't know. Um, really so these will be shared infrastructure. Yeah, there are. I mean, there are lots of uh, projects, at least in Scandinavia, going on around that. Between, oh, but you would share nicely in Scandinavia. Um, that, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> actually nice. But to answer the other thing, um, what we actually you were explaining here in this, we are currently seeing extreme number of variations of technologies, innovations, and people doing it in different ways. Experimentation, basically, people trying to find the right dominant design, as we say. And in the future, a couple of years from now, we're going to see a bit of consolidation of this field, right? So we're not going to see so much um, services and so much competition. We're going to have competitive forces to, you know, clean up this mess for us. And we're going to have this, um, you know, selection and retention. This is a typical evolutionary economics theory, right? You have a variation of different companies, mm -hmm. then you have selection and retention. So now we are living in the space of where we have extreme amount of um, innovation that's going to be, um, you know, slimmed down significantly as we progress um, in technology maturity, consumer preferences, competition forces, regulation. This all these forces are going to stream it down for us. Yeah. Well, competition forces aren't active yet. I don't think. Um, well, competition yeah. authorities aren't active yet. In the Not yet. Here, and that's probably something they're grappling with. Um, Erica, did you want to take on this this question? Yeah. There's an expression I heard, which I, I think still rings true to this, and it, it's that people will naturally gravitate to whatever is easiest, cheapest, and mm -hmm. best. And I, I think to, to give one example, there was a brewery in London that for a while tried to launch their own beer coin. So to use this beer coin, you had to, first of all, buy Ethereum, a digital currency which at the time this was a few years ago was was not easy to work out how to buy and then you had to open up a special app um from this bitcoin and you had to send your ethereum to that app and then buy this bitcoin and then you had to send a crypto transaction to be able to buy your beer in exchange for which you saved 10 percent off the price of your beer and they thought well you know for, for the, the saving of 10 percent, everybody's going to be buying this beer coin nobody bought the beer coin. Mm -hmm. the project failed because it was so difficult i mean they, they even gave me free free beer coins and i still wasn't going to use this beer coin because it was just so complicated and you know for the occasional drink that i or other people would get it's just so much easier and and in this case time cheaper to just tap your iPhone and pay the five or whatever it is for a, a pint of beer or a drink, then using all of that complicated process. So, and so I, I think that's just one example of why people will just stick to what is easiest. So I think what will be needed, and I think what will happen, is using DeFi will become easier. So one one of the trends we're seeing is a massive brain drain from traditional industry into crypto and DeFi and digital asset platforms. A, a lot of the smartest people I've ever met are moving from the biggest companies, from leading roles, from incredibly well-paid roles into these startups because they're more excited by it. These, these are people that don't need the money or they've done all the, the corporate thing and they're taking their experience, they're taking their knowledge, they're taking their networks, they're taking everything with them. And, and, and as a result, the, the whole industry is evolving so rapidly and so quickly. So I, I think it will be a bit like AI at some point, it will just take off and, and become better and easier to use. And, and then people will just go to using DeFi apps because in, in whatever way that we probably can't even imagine now, they'll be mm -hmm. easier or cheaper or better that people will just want to use the DeFi app rather than tapping their iPhone. One feature you touched on, on sort of the traditional legacy system, it, it isn't practical now to send small amounts digitally. It costs a lot of money. Every transaction costs a lot of money. So, for example, if, if you, Natasha, have got a no longer Twitter, but a social media account, and you want to pay 
everybody who likes your post one p or one cent for doing so. You can't really do that very easily digital or it goes in this traditional system and then people worry about, well, how do I know she's paid the right royalties? And, and one of the, the huge benefits of, of, of not, not just DeFi, but the blockchain and crypto ecosystem here is that you can send micro amounts for any micro amount and you can see in live time who's got that transaction. So what DeFi does is open up a huge wealth of pay per use, pay per content, pay per like, pay per listen to song, pay per read of article, whatever that is, it opens up a huge range of possibilities that people can do and see in a lifetime, which is just better than the traditional system. I mean, one example of this is people might pay £10 a month to subscribe to a newspaper, mm -hmm. but then what if you want to read one article by a different newspaper? You're not going to start a subscription. Yeah. So you'll just either find a way to get around the pay barrier or you're just not going to read it. But what if you've got a, a little wallet on your screen that lets you just click tap and then that pays whatever that is, 5p, 10p, a pound or whatever to read that article, to access that thing on a one-off. There's yeah. so exactly. much. The media is always I think, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, yeah. just to explain this idea of uh, micropayments that, yes, they cost a lot, but not everywhere, right? In Scandinavia, that issue has been solved. And guess what? Without blockchain. It's just a very old traditional interbank collaboration of creating a new, uh, their own payment rails. And I can send anyone I want one Danish Corona, which is basically nothing. And it's not going to cost me anything. It's not going to cost the bank much as well in that sense. So again, going back to the question, is blockchain the right technology that's going to you know, substitute um, or basically be the foundation upon which we perform our financial services? I think it's still... Um, pending out there. I think we still haven't seen the, the killer use case in that sense. Maybe we should all go on a paid research trip to Scandinavia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they'd have to teach us how to be nice and um, and work nicely with each other. And I, I don't know that Scandinavia has conquered that, but it hasn't exported it um, as a thing. I want to go to smart contracts because we you haven't really dwelt on these very much. And usually they're the sort of I usually hear about them as the center point of why we need DeFi. Yeah. We need DeFi so we can have smart contracts. Um, do we need DeFi so we can have smart contracts? Um, and do we want smart contracts? And finally, I suppose, with, in the retail context, what what excitement would they bring us? I don't, I don't think we need DeFi, specifically DeFi, as opposed to digital assets in, in various forms of smart contracts. I, I, I think for retail, i.e. mainstream user, that they're already used now in, in traditional banking and in, in various industries. But one of the things that smart contracts do to sort of translate it into regular English as opposed to tech speak it, is it, it gives you the ability to set rules uh, around money. So it, it could be, for example, it could there's a sort of an escrow function, for example. So I, I release this money to Natasha on proof that she has done X, Y, Z. Or it could be that the, there's a lot of use cases being talked about. I mean, for example, give kids pocket money, which could now be done digitally. It could be you, you set sort of the, the rules into that, that the pocket money could be spent at this shop, but not that shop. Or it could be spent on an apple, but not on porn or what, you know, what, whatever. <laughs> um, and then there's, there's talks about how medical payments can be used. Or, for example, in the, in the charity sec the sector, there's, there's a lot of worry that donations don't all go to the intended recipient. And, and in some cases, it's something as little as 4% of donations go to the intended recipient and the rest gets eaten up in admin and in costs and in bribes and in mercedes for whatever whatever so uh, that, that, that's perhaps an extreme example but what smart contracts facilitate is a you can set a rule that this money goes specifically to buy panda food or build a panda house or whatever whatever it is that you want or it, it, it can it, you can sort of see that transparency that this money i can see that 80 percent of my donation went to buy this specific type of panda food. I, I'm giving a really sort of basic example, but to, to envisage. So there's a lot of use cases financially where smart contracts could be very useful for determining that the money you want to give for various purposes goes to the recipients that you're happy with. Of course, now you go into the CBDC side, governments are also looking at using that, that technology to control 
citizens in a very negative way in some cases because it's well we'll just block this payment if you don't do as we like um but uh, as a core cool use there's a lot of of use use cases for for people and in and in real retail and commerce but DeFi, we don't need to have DeFi to have smart more smart contracts so smart contracts is a technology that works with with certain protocols and certain digital currencies so could you have smart contracts in a centralized setup yes, yes. I, I, i'm sure it's not how uh the, the the creators might have intended them but yes it is mm. technically possible yeah and 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 already being used so so i'm going to end with the final question on whether DeFi needs a cbdc <laughs> no nobody needs a cbdc yeah. cbdc's are bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah. CBDCs right. are bad and dangerous and nobody needs one and every government should be banned from issuing them that's my opinion right. firm, firm <laughs> <you there. laughs> do you yeah. agree you know? I absolutely I agree about that and I think even banks themselves they actually know that they don't need them but I think for some reason maybe like the FOMO effect like fear of missing out or just being on top of innovation and keeping a tap of what's going on and being part of the conversation they kind of have to do it it's extremely difficult and to, it's just pointless at some point. So I think, um, yeah, just going to see maybe some kind of a projects being, you know, put together, but maybe dissolving at some point. So, yeah. Okay. But so we'll, we'll, so a CBDC won't be at the, sorry, Erica. No, so the, the only beneficiaries of CBDCs are central banks and governments who want to use them to control. A bit more control, of course. Uh, yeah. Citizens of course. And, and get total data over them i think for everybody else they should be rightly terrified so if cbdc's won't be at the center of DeFi, um will cent where will central banks be in relation to DeFi? so at the moment they really sit i think at the center of the financial system they don't do everything within the financial system but you can take a few things out of the, out the financial system regulatory supervisory wise and and things would still stand might look a bit wobbly if you took a central bank out of the equation uh, and its systems then then everything else stops so where are central banks in the DeFi system? I, I are they at the center of it? I think they'll be running alongside. So the way I would imagine it happening is a CBDC will be eventually used to replace what we could, we see as pounds now. It will be basically the digital pounds, just in a way that's fully digitized eventually and in a way that gives more power and control to, to governments and to the central bank. Uh, I think what will happen is people then become aware of that and, and hopefully would trust that system less and might put more money into alternative things such as, as DeFi. So I would see it as, as two separate things running alongside each other. Yeah, I, I agree with this running alongside each other. For me, the role of the central bank will be more still kind of governing, managing the central part of finance we have, but also increasingly the interplay between the CFI and DeFi, right? Remember in in my prediction, at least, you still have the traditional banks, but then as they embrace more and more and open up some of their doors to um, DeFi services, you know, there's this interplay between this both worlds. So how, how are we going to do that? So I think the bank will probably have to look into, into this um, and, I don't know, maybe kind of um, decide what's the best way to uh, just set the perimeters around it. Well, if, if now that you've read, I'll point you to the... Um... The BIS paper on the unified ledger, which I think, mm. which I think is is quite an interesting vision of um, an alternative vision, certainly to <laughs> to the one you you both have espoused on this. So um, I think we ought to get you back again to discuss it. It's such a big topic. Um, I think we've rather taken off too much more than we could chew in a in a single um, podcast podcast episode. Um, but lots lots more to follow up on. And you've left me with a quite a confused, really, insight into C5, D5. It's, it's going to be an exciting journey, it's, uh, an exciting and very messy journey, I think, um, is probably the conclusion, um, but very exciting. Thank you, Kalina. Thank you, Erica. Please come back. Um, and I hope you enjoyed today's session. Thank you for hosting. Not at all. So I'll be back with another episode exploring the big issues in fintech and in the meantime if you want to keep up to date with the latest research thinking and the shoes in fintech be sure to sign up to the center's core insight newsletter that will deliver all the analysis you need direct to your inbox a link will be in today's episode notes and subscribe to the core insights podcast like today's so you don't miss the next episode in this fintech series with warwick business school's gilmore center for financial technology thank you